So before I begin, what um, hands, show of hands, who's here because they like dentistry? Oh, okay, and who's here because they hate dentistry? Okay, fine. Cool, that's pretty standard. It's, um, so I think one of the reasons why I wanted to do this as a presentation is that I really found that once I knew how to take diagnostic x-rays and how to interpret them, it actually made me enjoy dentals a lot more. Um, and as a result, I had a lot more fun. So um, this, we're going to focus on, just go through lots of examples. I think there's like 50 cases here. And so we're going to go through a, a relatively fast pace. But if anyone has any questions, feel free to, to dip in. It doesn't matter if we don't cover them all. It doesn't matter. But, um, feel free to ask questions at any point, and we can cover. Um, I'm not going to cover any positioning today, um, because I feel like it's kind of, there's other resources you can do that, and we could potentially do that again if people are really keen. Otherwise, there's some resources at the end that'll um, cover that. So, um, good example of this I added last minute. This is the case we had last week and just really highlights it. So we saw this case because it had a broken um, left mandibular canine and it was in for a root canal. And just as an incidental finding, we spotted, okay, fine, you're missing the first premolar here. You can see that weirdly erupting on the other side. Um, so take an x-ray and little guy hiding. So just this happens all the time. The more x-rays you take, the more underlying pathology you'll find that you would have otherwise just missed. And this is a classic example that because it's so subtle, if you're just doing a routine check of this at a neuter and you're not specifically trying to count your teeth, then that certainly would have been overlooked. And then this will be really prone to forming an, an, um, a dentigerous cyst that will cause big problems later. So better to know about it now and um, just treat it, then it's relatively easy. This is the same dog looking at the other, um, uh, the rest of the teeth. So this is the right mandibular carnassial or the right mandibular first molar. And here, little crown fracture with a questionable pulp exposure there. And took an x-ray. And here you can see big periapical lucencies. And again, this is just an incidental finding. And fair enough, this dog was in because we were doing a root canal on one tooth. So it was already predisposing it to um, having crown fractures. But again, it's, I had no idea that this was going to be this significant. And this is already causing a problem for this dog. So why are dental x-rays important? Um, so just quickly show of hands who's got dental x-ray. Assume it, sorry, let's do it the other way around. Who hasn't got dental x-ray? Okay, cool. Well, well done for being here and learning in advance. Um, and how many people have a system that fits into their regular x-ray machine that they take for limbs in a, a big cassette or how many? So yeah, let's ask that question is, how many people have x-rays plates that fit into the, a big cassette that then goes into their standard x-ray machine? Yeah, throw them in the bin. Um, <laughs> so we'll talk about that briefly in a minute. But um, I can't stress enough the value of having a, an individual um, plate system. They're much higher quality and well worth it. So um, there's a lot of evidence. So this is a study that was done 25 years ago. Uh, that showed that clinically important findings will be found in about 40% of cats and 30% of dogs, even when no clinical lesions are found. So this is a kind of landmark paper. And since then, there's been other studies that have supported these findings and repeated them. Um, and it raises to 50% of cases when you've got an intraoral lesion. So if you've got a cat with tooth resorption that you can see intraorally, then 50% of the time you'll find something else significant that will be relevant. Um, and the classic saying is you wouldn't ask an orthopedic surgeon to do orthopedic surgery on a fracture if you don't have an x-ray. And the same should be true for dentistry is if we're ever going to do an extraction, you really need to have a dental x-ray of that. Um, and it'll ultimately, it should be quite fast and it'll make your life easier. Um, so main thing is diagnosing more pathology will benefit patient welfare. It'll increase practice revenue if you know how to do it right. Um, and the main one for me is it'll reduce your frustration. Um, then in doing so, it'll reduce your complications and your risks um, and allows you to prioritize and plan your procedure. So it'll be much more enjoyable when you know what you're getting self in, yourself into or being able to decide when there's too much going on in this mouth and we know, okay, fine, I'm going to have to stage this straight away and um, I'm going to do what I can, take away the worst teeth and then call the carer and say, 
actually, this, we're going to have to do this in two stages, and that's okay. So, what are the main barriers? You're probably all familiar with this. So, main one is confidence. Thank you for being here. Um, confidence, so confidence in taking, and then confidence in interpreting. Um, so, would this change anything? So, as we spoke about just now, there's a good body of evidence that says yes, but they'll only change things if you, if you take them and find them enough. Whereas if you only take them occasionally, then the barriers that come into place that slow you down because you're taking them so infrequently mean that actually it's barely worth doing. Um, then there's time taken to take and interpret. Um, and I think a barrier for a lot of vets, and me certainly when I used to do it, is that if you find more pathology, it means you have to spend longer in the dental room and um, you are more likely to be over your estimate with a client, which means more hassle communicating. And that is a frustration, but I think we have to just remind ourselves that actually finding pathology is good for the patient and it's silent pathology that um, you otherwise no one's going to know about and the owner certainly isn't going to know about. Uh, and then equipment errors, quality, familiarity, and all of these will get better if you practice. If you just make it part of your routine is, okay, we will take a standard set whenever there's any problems, uh, then the faster you'll get and the more fun you'll have. Um, very briefly into the types of dental x-ray, just so everyone's on the same page. So this is a CR system or computerized radiography. So these are small plates that fit into a, a single planner, a uh, single processor. Um, so these, you've got small thin plates that are relatively inexpensive. This is the expensive part and um, these can get thrown away accidentally, but other than that, they're quite easy to replace. But it is important to, if you've got big scratches on your plates, to factor in that they do need replacing from time to time. Um, and it's one of those things that often practices will kind of do these to death and they'll be um, almost not worth it once they've uh, used them for years. Then this is the system I absolutely hate because I've experienced it long enough and in general practice. Um, and there's so many barriers to using this system that um, it just, it really inhibits you wanting to take them. Uh, and then there's a CR system. So traditionally it was just this size. And then now there's recently a, a larger size become available. Um, so I am a big fan of this system because of the speed it takes. But this one also is fine as long as we're not using this one. Um, if we can do something better. Um, and I've got a vested interest to declare in that um, I've got a, because I really like this and it's just come out, I've got a company that's distributing these. So come chat to me afterwards if you uh, are interested. Um, one more thing about mounting before we go through more actual x-rays is um, this is what I used to think was necessary. So I used to put a right marker using a needle on my x-ray films that used to cause scratches and used to take time. Now, some people may already default to not knowing that that's not necessary, but it's worth just communicating that you shouldn't need this. So with labial mounting, which is just a posh way of saying how the x-rays, how we position the x-rays, you should immediately be able to look at a film and say, okay, what tooth is this? And it'll, um, once you know the rules, it'll come up quite quickly. So unlike the other x-rays that we take where we're going through and the x-ray could be uh, dorsoventral or ventrodorsal, the nature of dental x-rays means the physics basically means they should always come out the same way. So if you look at this skull and you look at the photo of this skull and you know that someone hasn't flipped this, someone's taken this photo and it's, you're looking at it now, you immediately know that this is the dog's left side and this is the dog's right side. And the same is true for dental x-rays. If you only rotate the dental x-rays that have come up on your system, then they should position themselves like this. Um, and so you, this is the same as this skull. Is This is the top left, and this is the top right. So these are the rules for this to happen. One important uh, distinction is if you've got a CR system in these plates, you just need to make sure that you're always taking towards the white side, which is the, um, the side you're supposed to take the x-rays towards, so it's white or blue. Make sure you're always taking towards that side. Um, and then never flip an image, only rotate them. And unless the only exception to this is if you're doing an extra oral view, which we won't get into, but if someone does do that, then that is an exception to this rule, but standard views where you're putting the plate within the mouth and taking from outside, this will always hold true. And then the other thing is just to learn your anatomy, um, which distinguishes whether you're talking about the maxilla or the mandible. So your um, turbinates and your palatine fissures in your maxilla, 
So here are my big um, distinguisher. Then your mandibular symphysis and the lack of turbinates here for your mandible is what I use. Um, for your maxilla, you've got the conchal crest and the dorsal, uh, the junction of the vertical body of the maxilla and the palatine process, basically this line here and the fact that you can see turbinates here. That means it's maxilla and then mandible, basically you haven't got anything else and you've got a mandibular canal running through. So interpreting um, dental x-rays. So there's a common saying within the vet dentist community that if you ask 10 vet dentists a question, you'll get 11 answers. And that holds true for both interpreting dental x-rays and for the treatment that they decide to do. Um, so you need to be systematic, you need to learn what's normal. And there is also variation between even experienced operators. So this paper came out last month and basically showed that um, even amongst um, dental specialists and residents, there was still quite a lot of difference between how they would interpret dental x-rays, particularly when it came to tooth resorption. Um, and so it's highly subjective. Now, don't think of that as disheartening. I'd say this is encouraging in that you're not that wrong. So, you'll be able to find someone who can support your interpretation, maybe. But do your best. Um, <laughs> Do your best, and um, we'll give you a few kind of pointers here. And there's not an absolute. Don't be afraid of taking dental x-rays because you never know what's going on. Just do more of them, and you'll gradually it'll all kind of come together. Um, but you kind of just have to go with, OK, this is what I feel. And if you're particularly unsure, then um, you can potentially stage it. Other thing is important to um, interpret in conjunction with your oral exam, so never just look at the x-rays. And if you're unsure, take more views. And if you're really unsure, just stage it. Just take a pause, send the x-rays to someone, namely us if you want, um, and seek advice while the patient waits. Ultimately, for most dental cases where um, there's questionable pathology, often we find, OK, we're actually not sure where this, uh, this tooth lies. Is it tooth resorption? It's, it's equivocal. Then um, you can stage it and say, fine. We're going to need to see this dog or cat back in six months, 12 months. And by that stage, it's probably going to have changed. And if it hasn't changed, fine, it's stable. And we can probably uh, carry on monitoring it. Um, soon, so AI-assisted interpretation is a thing that is happening even within the dentistry industry. And um, soon, it'll probably take over and help us all out as well. But not quite yet. So um, going through a system where I've outlined the x-rays that we're going through with different colors. So should I refer it? Now, ultimately, I don't know your level. And this is just a general, general practice level. If you're keen on dentistry, cool, you can do more. Um, if you're not, sure, refer more. But from my opinion, what you most vets would be able to do in general practice, I've circled in green. Orange is mm, if you're really comfortable with dentistry, you could do a few. You could do this in primary care, but don't be afraid to refer it, certainly. Dotted is refer it if you've got a really motivated carer who wants to try and save that tooth. Otherwise, extracting it won't be wrong. Um, and then red is, OK, yeah, you probably should be referring this. So what is normal? So first of all, look at the gross anatomy artifacts superimposing structures. So um, while we're getting onto that, we'll just go through essential anatomy on x-rays. Uh, so you've got your pulp in the middle. Then you've got your dentine, the next layer out from the pulp. In the crown, in the mouth, you've got your, um, uh, your enamel. And then your cementum. Sorry, you can't see the cementum right now. But you've got your periodontal ligament coming around this black line around the outside of the tooth. And then some of you may be able to see you've got a lamina dura, which is the white line just outside the periodontal ligament, which is basically slightly thickened bone. Uh, so normal, uh, normal anatomy and superimposing structures. So this is a nice example where this uh, x-ray, this might look like you've got a bit of bone loss here. But actually, if you follow it around, you can see that the dog's lip is superimposing over there. So actually, it could give you a false impression. And again, if you're interpreting in light of the clinical exam, then um, it'll probably be more obvious that that is an artifact rather than anything else. 
So do an overall check, just have a, remember to take a step back and just try, even though you've got a patient on the table and you're trying to work as fast as you can, um, try and just look at everything in total and just check that you don't have a whopping great tumor anywhere. Um, this is how I go through my, um, my list in my head. You can do this in any order, but whatever works for you. Um, so then periodontal disease status is obviously the reason why we're doing most teeth and most, even if we're, they're not presenting for that, most dogs will have some degree of periodontal disease we want to know about. That includes furcation exposure. Um, all of these we're going to go through in more detail uh, with examples in a bit. This is just an overview. Um, then periapical region, make sure we haven't got any um, periapical abscesses or peri periapical pathology going on. Any abnormalities to the bone, any abnormalities to the crown, so um, caries or crown fractures often. Any abnormalities to the root shape, any pulp abnormalities. And this is a cat, so similarly, this is just a typical normal cat. So, uh, going through gross anatomy and superimposition. So, um, gross anatomy, one of the most important things to just be aware of what is normal is that normal changes with age. So, uh, this is a young dog, I can tell immediately, in the fact that um, it's got a very wide pulp. So... In, within your pulp, you have a dentoblast, which lay down dentine over time. So basically, this layer, your dentine, will get thicker, and therefore your pulp will get narrower as the dog ages. And then similarly, along that line, you've got an open apex here, which will close as, it, um, as the dog matures, and that will fill with, uh, with dentine. And so that will close fully by about a year. Um, so this dog, at a glance, I mean, it's got a deciduous tooth here, but... Um, you can say that, okay, this dog is probably around about six months old. Uh, the other way that that can be useful is that the odontoblast will carry on laying down dentine, narrowing the pulp, if the tooth is still alive. But if the tooth is dead, then it will stop doing that. So one way you can tell there's a problem with the tooth is if compared to the other tooth on the other side, if it's, if it's present, if it's got a wider pulp, then the one with the wider pulp will probably have died sometime in the past. But that won't happen immediately. That'll be, say, a year later, depending on the tooth, um, and it'll give you a clue as to whether or not that tooth is vital or not. Um, other normal anatomy to be aware of is your mental foramen. So you've got three of them. There's a, a rostral one over here that no one cares about. Middle one over here that uh, is the biggest, and then your caudal. Um, so this is a, just a nice x-ray that shows how your caudal mental foramen might look on an x-ray and similar kind of appearance, your um, middle mental foramen, just to be aware of. Your mandibular canal, so runs uh, in the center of your mandible and really important is to, when you're doing a mandibular tooth extraction, just be aware how your teeth relate to your mandibular canal, um, so how far in it they sit but usually it's not actually that they're within it they're one side or the other most commonly but um, it's just worth being aware how uh, how much danger you're in when you're doing that extraction and how much uh, of the bone you can take away be conscious where your three rooted teeth lie so um, this one for example just coming across you just bear in mind that these are 3d structures so particularly your three rooted teeth when they're superimposed 2D. So here you've got one root, two roots, and then your third root. And similarly on your um, maxillary, left maxillary first molar, here you've got one root, two roots, and three roots. And so this one's got severe periodontal disease, uh, which we'll get onto in a minute. Um, other thing that may be normal for you is um, any blood, fingerprints, or scratches to the plate. So this one, if we knew who, uh, who did it, we could probably identify them from the uh, fingerprints, couldn't we, Simon? Um, <laughs> um, so this um, is a good example of just when you're handling these x-ray films, just be aware that your fingerprints, if they're particularly if they're bloody, but also just sweat, will come across on them. And um, all you need to do is clean this film and you'd have a much, much better picture um, than you do anyway. And we'll talk about chevron signs later. 
So overall check. Now we get into the fun x-rays. So um, have you got any missing teeth? So we had a good example of a simple missing tooth earlier. This one would be a bit more complex. So this is a relatively young dog with a missing right mandibular canine. And um, in reality, we've got some deciduous teeth that are partially resorbing. Uh, and this would be a fairly challenging extraction that um, <clears throat> I'd say only go into if you're fairly comfortable that you're not going to break the jaw. Um, but that would make us sweat, certainly. Uh, always check for extra teeth. This is probably not the best example for extra teeth um, in that this is hidden within a cyst here. Um, so I think this extra tooth was unerupted, but um, it's worth taking an x-ray of any extra tooth or just any time you take an x-ray, just trying to check that there's not another tooth um, hiding away. This dog had an extra... Um, first pre -maxi left maxillary first premolar um, and inevitably it's a boxer which are the type that always have um, cysts around their first premolars and here you can see the cysts so other things overall you can check for cysts uh, persistent deciduous teeth so here you can see and this is a nice example of um, just checking your films carefully again when you're under pressure so this one it's it you almost could be forgiven for thinking that the root comes up here and stops there. But in reality, that's the superimposition over the first premolar here, where the root comes up and around there, and that is not resorbing at all. That's got the whole root that does need to come out. Uh, and then the premolar sits over there and just happens to line up. Um, this one, assuming that this isn't a crown fracture, we'll ignore that for this purpose, but certainly deciduous teeth, yeah, you can do in practice. Um, this is a deciduous tooth, so you can usually tell that deciduous tooth are much more frail than their counterparts, and they're usually a mirror image of the one that behind them as an adult version. Um, so this is a right mandibular... Um, I mean, I've forgotten. I think it's the four, third premolar. Um, I'll check that. Anyway, um, deciduous teeth are hard. Um, so this one doesn't have an adult counterpart, but is super fragile. So this one, uh, you can sometimes leave a deciduous tooth if it doesn't have an adult, adult counterpart, but usually they're so fragile that they're prone to fracturing. So if they're not going to benefit the animal, then better to take them out. So it's a probably best to take this out, but it's going to be a pretty challenging extraction because it's super fragile. Uh, retain root remnants. Uh, so this is one that was referred to us because they uh, didn't know why it um, had complications post-surgery. And they'd done a crown amputation here. And um, obviously, when you've got good quality of dental x-rays, it's pretty clear that this is not an appropriate candidate for a crown amputation. And this dog, sorry, cat had um, a lot of inflammation at the back of the mouth and was really painful and immediately much better as soon as those were taken out. Um, and then important part of the overall check is try and take a step back and just have a glance and just check that you haven't got any really weird bone. This is obviously an extreme case. Um, this is a cat's left mandible. Um, and this is pretty typical for a squamous cell carcinoma, although, of course, without a biopsy, it could be um, um, osteo... Um, myelitis? Thank you. <laughs> Osteomyelitis. Uh, so, interpreting periodontal disease. So, first thing is, have a glance at um, in your mouth as you're doing the routine exam, and this is quite a nice example. So, just at a routine glance, we expected to go into this dog thinking, okay, this isn't going to be uh, going to be too dramatic. Can't see anything hugely abnormal on conscious exam. Under anaesthetic, oh, and also remarkably minimal levels of calculus and plaque on this dog. Um, on probing, okay, there is a little bit of um, redness you can see here, and there was a deep pocket here, but it's hard to interpret. Just with probing alone, it's hard to know how much that represents of the rest of your tooth surface. So probing and x-rays go hand in hand. So this is the x-ray of that, um, that tooth. And so you've got two levels of bone here. So on what it's bone is obviously 3D. So on one side, you've lost 
all the way down to here. And on the other side, you've got some, but um, still the bone level should be up here. So before we come back onto that, let's talk about how we do normal periodontal disease assessment with x-rays. So we'll look at this root. And what we want to do is basically measure from the root tip to the roughly where the cementum enamel junction is, which basically means here on this tooth, you can see the cementum is this extra dense white line here, where that cement, sorry, that's the enamel. Um, and the enamel comes into the cementum here, and that's roughly where your bone height should be. And that would be 100%. Now, this dog has almost 100% bone on this tooth, but on this, sorry, over this mesial root. But what we're looking for is attachment loss. So if this bone height was anywhere along here, you'd have 0 to 25%. Anywhere here to here would be 25 to 50%. And then here is the danger zone where you've got more than 50%. And as a general rule, the, uh, the way we'd say is we call it stage four or severe periodontal disease. And when you've got 50% attachment loss. So if you've got 50% attachment loss, that is an indication that that tooth almost certainly needs extracting. Even in our hands, there's really nothing you can, uh, you can do to save that tooth. Even with perfect oral home care, that tooth is a goner. The periodontal disease is going to progress rapidly and um, it's best taken out. So coming back to this, we can see here, this, so you've got at least 25% up, uh, up to the one level of bone, but it's at any aspect of the root. If you've got over 50%, then um, the tooth really should need extracting. So here you've got um, uh, past 50% and then it's probably up to here. So it's probably at about 60%. Now I've dotted this in orange in that if you had a super motivated carer and um, they wanted to do everything to save the tooth, then fair enough, you could refer it and we could try. But we'd uh, make that decision based on the situation. So if we had someone who had been trying to brush this dog's teeth all its life and it had got to this point, then we know, okay, the prognosis is arguably quite bad. Even though they're trying to brush, they're not having much success there. Whereas if you've got, say, a rescue dog that they've suddenly come into a new owner's uh, possession or new carer's uh, carership and um, they are now going to initiate brushing and they're really motivated and they're going to come back in six months for another cleaning under anaesthetic, then fair enough, because it's unilateral, maybe we could give it a go at some deep pocket treatment and cleaning. But the prognosis for this tooth is pretty guarded, whatever. So this is the same dog. Um, and so this is the left maxilla. And taking the x-rays, similar kind of pattern where unexpectedly bad beneath the surface and fair enough, you could detect this with probing, but um, it just gives you a much clearer picture. So this one has probably 80 to 90% of um, attachment loss. So this tooth would have actually been quite mobile. And then coming to the back, you've got um, your first molar here. So that's got complete uh, attachment loss around the um, mesio buccal root and um, complete attachment loss loss around the distobuccal root and then the palatal root also has a periapical lucency so basically it's, this tooth is just holding in by something about there um, and similarly around your fourth premolar here if you measure from here where your bone should be to there you've got mm, probably approaching on 40 percent attachment loss so we'd look at it in context is once we take this tooth away, maybe this tooth will um, have a better chance of being maintained and cleaned. So we'd probably give this one a benefit of a doubt. It wouldn't be wrong to extract this, but um, once we've taken this off, if you've got a motivated owner, carer, then um, you could just keep an eye on that one and come back to it and um, as long as they're going to keep an eye on it. But again, it's um, pretty guarded. Other thing that ties into periodontal disease is furcation exposure. So that's the area between the roots of multi-rooted teeth. So complete through and through furcation exposure with a dental probe is an indication for extraction. And you can usually get a clue to this on x-ray. So it's most important is whether your probe can get through, but it'll 
dental x-rays will often give you a place to go back and check because sometimes you, if you haven't got the angle quite right then um, sometimes your probe won't get through and I'm not saying force your probe you have to be quite gentle and you don't want to make a uh, no great question no so this is um, anything going beneath the gum line anything that's touching soft tissues should be using your periodontal probe which is the one with um, a blunt tip and usually um, millimeter markers uh, the sharp tip should be used just on the crown, um, usually checking um, for pulp exposure would be the classic one. Um, so, for example, on this one, I'd probably, I'd hope that I'd pick these up with, um, uh, with my dental probe, but if I didn't, then the x-ray would say, okay, fine, go back and check these, because these, again, are, once you've got through and through um, vocation exposure, then you're at severe periodontal disease and tooth really should be extracted. Um, this is a good example of partial exposure. So you can see here that um, you've got some lucency. So that basically, again, that your probe will get part of the way through. It won't go all the way through. And that might be a, if it can go 50% of the way through, then it will be a stage two. But basically, again, one to watch and make sure that you're cleaning out this pocket as best you can. Worth having a look at this x-ray and comparing it to the next one where this one don't forget to go back to your oral exam and look at it in context so in this one not furcation exposure that was an oral tumor that happened to be situated over the furcation causing lysis um, so this came back as an acanthomatous amyloblastoma which are um, locally very aggressive so um, they, you need to excise them with wide margins to make sure that they go away completely. Otherwise, they can cause big problems. So this would be an example of something to refer. Um, it's worth talking about cats in the context of periodontal disease is that where we spoke about this for dogs, um, and this holds true for how we describe cats, but we're more aggressive with our extractions. So in cats, we would consider anything that's PD3 is arguably worth coming out. So if you've got 25 to 50% attachment loss in a cat, then depending on the situation, arguably those teeth should probably come out. 50% um, certainly, there's no question. Um, so yeah, these are just examples of severe periodontal disease in cats with complete furcation exposures. We're moving on to periapical disease. So um, I'm sure some of you who take dental x-rays are used to seeing periapical lucencies, which is one of the big, um, big findings in dogs, certainly. Um, so they're not necessarily a tooth through abscess, but that's one of the dis differentials. But it's usually a sign of inflammation or occasionally a cyst. Um, and so here, for example, this. Um, here is a periapical lucency around this tooth root. And here, this is not a periapical lucency. This is a chevron sign, which is a normal anatomical feature we'll get onto in a minute. But it's worth, worth noting that you can, amongst a few teeth, you can get some um, normal artifacts, as it were, um, or normal anatomy that can look a little bit like a periapical lucency. Uh, so this isn't the one we saw earlier, but it's very similar. So this is classic periapical lucency, where it bulges outwards um, and is lucent. This one is less, um, less clear, and if I didn't know about the case, then I wouldn't be certain about this. Uh, but here, there's just a, certainly a loss of definition, and I'd be sitting on the fence on this one, apart from the fact that I know that this uh, dog had a crown fracture here, um, and I think we took another view which um, confirmed that yes, this was lucent and um, the other thing you can do is take a x-ray of the other tooth and see whether or not that's also lucent if you're unsure. So chevron signs, just quickly, are a non-pathological widening of the periodontal ligament often seen at the apex of the canines, incisors and mandibular first molars, usually in dogs. So here, again, around the incisors, these look like they could be lucencies. Um, one clue is that they're it's so symmetrical across them, but um, it's 
Uh, Chevron signs are thought to be due to a relatively thin bone density at the root apex because of the presence of vascular channels. And so the thing to do is evaluate your um, periodontal ligament and your lamina dura around the root apex. And periapical lucencies tend to be more round, more bulbous, um, and they're not continuous with the periodontal ligament. So your periodontal ligament comes around, um, whereas a, um, sorry, a, che a chevron sign would be continuous with your periodontal ligament rather than a periapical lucency, which won't be. So if in doubt, take more radiographs. So here, your mandibular first molar, so this is normal. Um, you just get a little bit of shadowing, and it follows the line of the periodontal ligament around and kind of mirrors the tooth rather than bulging outwards. <clears throat> uh, bone abnormalities, so here I've included some periodontal disease um, just in a few of these. So here you've got maybe 25% um, attachment loss distally on that first um, mandibular first molar tooth. This is the same dog a year later. So I think we um, tried cleaning that out and I can't remember why we didn't take this out, but I think we regretted it. Well, I regretted it. Um, and then a year later, yep, much worse. And in hindsight, we should have taken this out, which was a um, severe periodontal disease when you look back in hindsight anyway. Um, and now it's at a point where it's really threatening, um, threatening the health of this first molar. So definitely get rid of him. And then this one, just about still salvageable for a motivated owner, but um, worth. Uh, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to extract this, certainly. Um, this is more periodontal disease. Oh, uh, another <coughs> sign of periodontal disease you can... Um, tell on your maxillary first and second molar teeth is a widening of the periodontal ligament space you can see here. So these ones are usually quite hard to, um, to interpret any bone loss. So that's one clue that um, there's something going on in that tooth is that classic widening. <coughs> um, again, this is um, more periodontal disease and just showing how significant it can be. <clears throat> so I'd hope that you, you would fit that with a probe, but it'd be hard to assess how bad that one was relative to this, is because your probe would probably come down here in this deep pocket, and you'd probably be wanting to extract that based on your probing. But actually, once this is gone, he's got a pretty good chance. Um, this one is not due to periodontal disease, excuse the annotations. Uh, this one was due to a malocclusion. So this dog had a um, linguoverted mandibular canine. And as a result, it had caused a palatal impingement. Um, and so been, um, I think it was a, a English bull terrier. And so getting things stuck in that, um, pushing them in, so pushing pieces of bone in. And I don't think this was yet an orinasal fistula, but this one did need this maxillary canine extracted as a consequence of the mandibular canine malocclusion. Again, one thing to keep an eye out for your malocclusions in your young dogs and catch them early so that we don't have to take the other teeth out. <clears throat> this is alveolar osteitis. You can sometimes, um, so cats tend to get this more frequently, but this is, uh, I think this is probably a pug. Um, and so this dog had only partial eruption of the canines. So often you'll see that um, they have these stubby little canines coming out in the mouth, and that's partly because they've never fully erupted. And so this much of the tooth should be out and it's in, uh, and basically um, your bone can't attach to the enamel. And so this makes a pocket that some um, plaque can get into and cause some ongoing inflammation. So then you get um, this self-perpetuating cycle of um, bony inflammation and plaque getting in there. Um, more bone. So this, again, is a cat with a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, a more fun one. So this, I can just imagine the vet who x-rayed this dog, where I think it was probably a two-year-old dog from what I remember, 
just because it's got a single missing tooth and something weird going on here, and suddenly you're encountering this chaos going beneath the surface. Um, does anyone want to venture what this might be? Yeah, cyst, sure. Um, so you have got a, a large cystic lesion, but the cyst is secondary to this, which is an odontoma, um, which is, uh, we'll call it a deve developmental tissue abnormality where um, they produce tissue abnormally. So it basically uh, developed there and then prevented this one from erupting and then big old secondary cyst. So refer that case. Um, or, or do it yourself, I don't care. Um, <laughs> okay, send it to me. Um, little note on fractured teeth. So this isn't a radiographic diagnosis, but we often have vets who um, say, I took an, it, it had a fractured tooth, I took an x-ray, and it was fine. Uh, x-ray doesn't actually tell you anything about whether or not you've got pulp exposure from a fracture. So it's worth... Um, just emphasizing this, so thank you for the sharp explorer probe question. It's under anesthetic with a sharp explorer probe. You want to basically check whether you've got pulp exposure. So um, this incisor, basically you should be running your probe across the surface. And if it's dropping or catching um, into a hole, then you've got pulp exposure and that's enough of a diagnosis. And then your x-rays support in, okay, have you got some inflammation? Have you got some other things going on that uh, are gonna complicate? treatment for this. So for example, this one has a um, crown root fracture as well. Um, it's important when you've got chronic wear, so often the tennis ball chewers uh, that wear slowly, then the teeth can lay down tertiary dentine. So um, if the wear is slow enough, then your dentine can be laid down that will repair teeth, but it has to happen slow, slow enough. So sometimes if you have a tennis ball chewer that's worn fast, you'll have some teeth that have pulp exposure and others that don't. Um, and so this one was a fracture, but others that have um, a fast wear can still have pulp exposure and those teeth with pulp exposure need treatment. And we'll get into that in a sec. Um, <clears throat> so this is this tooth here. And you can see it's already, so that's not a chevron lucency, that is a periapical lucency. Um, so it's got some ongoing inflammation because of that fracture. This is a sharp explorer probe. So this one is um, chronic wear with some tertiary dentine. You can see this uh, brown circle, but that shepherd's hook or sharp explorer probe was catching in that pulp. So that tooth needs treatment. And similarly, easy to miss is these ones. So this one's fine, no pulp exposure. You can tell at a glance, similarly here, but run your probe over it anyway. Whereas this one did have pulp exposure. And when you do an X-ray, there we go. And um, little periapical lucencies as well. So when you take these X-rays more commonly, you will uh, find these periapical inflammation. Uh, this one I've dotted in orange, not because of saving this one, take that out, but if you wanted to save this one, then um, that would need a root canal, and that's probably referral. Uh, I never understood when I was in general practice why pulp exposure matters, apart from some people were shouting at me that it's important, but I was also simultaneously seeing patients that had seemed to have no problem living with this for years, and it's really hard to then motivate those carers to, uh, to then go ahead and treat that tooth that they've just been, um, been ignoring. So this hopefully should justify this. So uh, firstly, painful when it first occurs. Then when the bacteria, the pulp then dies off, it's probably not painful for a while, um, but bacteria will ingress and then predispose inflammation around the apex, and that ultimately Will, will become a tooth root abscess at some point um, if you give it enough time. So there's a really interesting study on uh, Greenland sled dogs. So in Greenland, they um, apparently used to, um, it's been outlawed since, but their sled dogs, they used to basically defang them or um, shorten the crowns without any other treatment. So this population of dogs where they'd all had their crowns shortened with pulp exposure, and they did post-mortems on these dogs to see, okay, what percentage of these dogs, when they've died for other reasons, have got periapical inflammation. And so 82% had 
periapical inflammation around these teeth. So that's in the lifetime of a dog. So it's not immediately you're going to get inflammation, and it's not every tooth, but statistically it's very, very likely over the lifetime there's going to be periapical inflammation, which is going to be an ongoing problem for both the immune system and not necessarily a tooth root abscess at this point, but predisposing a tooth root abscess that becomes an acute and kind of really, really important and vital problem. So treat it before it gets to that. Um, and more importantly, dogs and cats can't express dental discomfort meaningly, so we have to advocate for them. So treatment options is um, you can extract it or you can do a root canal. Um, uh, usually we only perform root canals on strategic teeth, so that's basically canines and carnassials. Um, and, oh, sorry, carnassials in, um, in dogs. For young dogs with very fresh fractures, if you can get them on the table of a veterinary dentist within 48 hours, which is really challenging, then you can do another procedure um, that I won't go into in too much detail. So now tooth resorption, everyone's favourite. Um, and probably why most of you are here, because of that frustration. <laughs> so very briefly, type 1 tooth resorption. So you've got, um, this is the American Veterinary Dent Dental Council um, or college um, classification. And they've basically done quite a lot of work to classify these guys. Um, so you've got a focal or multifocal radio lucency within the tooth, but otherwise normal radio opacity and normal periodontal ligament. So these ones extract all the roots. Then type two, so um, otherwise known as the holy grail, is when you see this brilliant. Um, you've got disappearance of the periodontal ligament space and um, decreased radio opacity of some of the tooth. So you can still have the crown affected. You may or may not have the crown affected while you've got the root, but what we care about is whether or not the root is fully resorbing. Uh, and then type 3, which is a combination of the two. So uh, one thing just to be aware of is that um, sometimes you can have the root that's disappearing, but it can be a type of inf inflammatory root resorption. Um, so it can kind of look like this, but going deeper into the root. And it's worth noting that that's not appropriate to do a crown amputation on. I'll show you an example later. But... Um, they basically, it'll be lucent rather than bony replacement, so it won't look like bone. Uh, and dogs, they do get tooth resorption. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the t different types of dog tooth resorption, but for most general practitioners, it will suffice to just say it has tooth resorption, it exists, and if you've documented it with x-rays, then um, that's, that's key, and then you can treat them in ways similar to cats. We'll go through a few examples. So um, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association has some guidelines. You can literally Google this, and I think it's 144 pages or something. And it's literally a free PDF, and it's uh, like a textbook that's available for free. Um, there's a reference at the end. It's, it's brilliant. Um, and so these are the, the kind of summary. Now, I find tooth resorption really frustrating and that it's quite controversial as to where you draw the line between what you can do a crown amp on and what you can't um, because it's, it's kind of a sliding scale. Um, and so I'll tell you what I'll do. Other vet dentists will certainly disagree and um, there's not an absolute right or wrong. But I think following most of these, um, these criteria as best you can. So you shouldn't have any periodontal ligament, no endodontic system, so no pulp, no peri periodontal disease, no endodontic disease, so no um, periapical pathology we were just talking about, periapical lucencies, and don't use it in caps with uh, caudal somatitis or FCGF. So we'll go through a few examples. Um, anyone else want to talk? Do you want to anyone say what they might do in this case? I'm going to take a drink and tell someone who volunteers. Can I start by swearing a little bit? And then... Yeah. So this is not a particularly nice one. Um, this, you've got a fair amount of pulp there. Your periodontal ligament comes around. You've got something. It's getting hazy, but you've got something. And then here, meh, 
frustrating. Sometimes these ones will surprise you in how much of the tooth you can get out sometimes. But this one, what I would, the way I would approach this canine is <clears throat> by making a flap anyway, because you know that if you're going to be able to do a crown amp, it's going to be a deep one down to here. Um, so I basically do a big flap and try and get this tooth out and basically see whether or not it, it's complying. So I think you'd have to give this one a reasonable attempt at trying to get that tooth out. But if it's really not coming, if it basically fractures here, I also wouldn't lose too much sleep about that. Um, I'd basically then, um, then do a deep crown amp after trying to, um, trying to extract it. But sometimes you're surprised, but yeah, this is... Uh, a nasty on the fence one where um, there's not an absolute right or wrong. But coming to the, um, the rest, you've got this um, second premolar is partly resorbing. Try and get him out, see what happens. Mesial root of your third premolar, all of that probably needs to come out as part of a big flap. Uh, and then here, this one's almost completely resorbed, but there's probably a little root tip there that does have a... Um, periodontal ligament so probably try and get all of that out um, and do a fairly good exposure over all those roots so this is a nasty one Sorry, yes yes so yes, I do a crown amputation with, and yes, definitely cover. So you want to get your, um, basically anywhere that you've done a crown amputation, you want your root to be a good millimeter or two beneath the surrounding alveolar bone. So the few times, the one time I can really think of that um, I've seen a complication of a crown amputation was where the vet had basically um, done a, a flat beveling of the, um, of not that resorby dentine, enough that they could do a crown amp, but basically the um, surrounding gingiva can't grow over dentine because it can't attach to it. So it basically formed a, a chronic inflammation because it couldn't heal over this, uh, this large exposed canine surface. Uh, so that's where you basically want to sink that beneath the ground and then um, tension-free closure over the top. Um, extract this one, what do we think? No. Um, so this one is pretty classic crown amputation and not even that deep. There's not too much to get, get out of him. Um, so yeah, you do a pretty standard crown amp on him. What do we think about this one? So I would say we've got periodontal ligament coming around and then gets a bit iffy and it's tricky with these two so often we'll see um, you'll see the two canines being at a similar level and they'll be more mild than this and they can be hard to interpret this one's tricky because this one's throwing you off in that it's so advanced and here I think there's something going on here and in light that this is a cat that is demonstrating tooth resorption I'd say yes this is almost certainly a problem but the other thing you can do if you're not sure take another x-ray <coughs> So took another x-ray, doesn't really help in terms of um, has this got tight to, or some tooth resorption affecting the root, uh, but you can see here, little bite out of the crown. Basically once you've got that bite, then that's going to start being painful and that tooth needs extracting. So suddenly that says, okay, fine, this tooth definitely needs to be extracted and you have enough periodontal ligament that you should be able to get the whole root out um, and it shouldn't be too too challenging as they go. Um, this one, I'd say you need to uh, get both of those roots out. You've got a good periodontal ligament and you've got a big old bite out of the... Um, is, it, is it canine hair attachment loss as well? Um, I would say that is, so yes, but I think probably because it's got some alveolar osteitis. So yes, your attachment should be up to here. So this should be a nice smooth line of your alveolar bone up to there. Um, so yes, you have got a little bit of periodontal disease, but not, uh, not enough that really threatens it. But then you've got, this is um, probably alveolar osteitis, so a little bit of bone inflammation around. With that canine, because it's got some loss on one side, um, periodontal ligament, does yeah. it? If, let's say, that fracture can get it out entirely, could you leave it? 
So you, pro you should try not to. I'd say this would be an example where I'd be surprised if this fractured. It's probably not because of the tooth resorption in this case. I think it's probably because a healthy, any tooth would have fractured with what was happening there um, to an extent. And um, it essentially comes down to you should try it. In this kind of case, then yes, you should try and get the, the root out if you can. But it always comes down to, OK, with a risk to benefit assessment, if you're going to do more harm trying to get that root out than by leaving it, then um, fair enough, that's, that's an argument to leave it. And that shouldn't be as a catch-all, OK, we, we can always get away by just saying, oh, well, I'm going to cause more damage. Um, but in exceptional circumstances, yeah, we do have to balance the risks of it causing a problem. But you'd have to inform the carer and say, OK, there is a root fragment, and do radiographic monitoring of that, basically. Um, this one, so yeah, this one, again, I'm deliberately showing cases that I'm not entirely certain about, and there's, there's not an absolute. So here you can see there's a bit of periodontal ligament coming around, but then it kind of goes woolly, nothing really there, and then really nothing on this mesial root. So I would say I'd be doing a crown amp on this one. And you can see this one also has um, lesions in the crown. This one, from what I remember, didn't have any lesions in the crown, but roots in the context of this one having tooth resorption and knowing how our x-ray machine is quite good at picking up a periodontal ligament typically, and that's obviously varies with your practice, then this one I'd say, yes, I've, I've got enough experience to know that we should see more periodontal ligament, ligament around that. So I'd probably be saying uh, crown amp on both of these. Would you say that second tooth wouldn't be painful? <sighs> Big debate. Um, probably, probably not. Some, some dentists say when, it, when tooth resorption starts to approach the, the pulp and the endodontic system, it could be painful. Others are more when it approaches the crown, then it's a real problem. Um, I think give it the benefit of a doubt and take it out when it's like this, or at least say, fine, this is, if you've got loads of other teeth that are more of a priority, you can say, okay, fine, this isn't top priority to get out now, but it's going to become that. Um, so if you've got time to take it out now, then, um, then do that. Otherwise, a cat with tooth resorption, ultimately other teeth are probably going to present in the future probably would be recommending doing x-rays again in a year's time um, so you could look at addressing it then. Uh, this is a dog and this one highlighted in orange because fairly tricky. Um, so this the uh, fourth mandibular fourth premolar with um, so this is a good example that I think this is probably so this is full-on root resorption um, that means you can only do a crown amp of this one and there's nothing really to get most of that way and then here you've got an isolated bit of um, apical root that you're going to cause a lot of trauma by going to get so that one I would leave that bit behind crown out that bit um, then this you should try and get this portion of root out but that is going to be challenging um, so refer it if you have to um, this one you should be able to do in practice. So the, the understanding is that for dogs, um, if I can get back quick enough. So for dogs, um, therapy recommends in cases with inflammatory resorption or exposure of the lesion to the oral cavity. So uh, where were we? Here. So this is a first, uh, mixed bag, frustrating. So this one, pretty small lesion as they go, but... Uh, exposure to the oral cavity, so probably painful as we understand it. So um, tooth needs extracting, but otherwise doesn't have too much tooth resorption. Uh, and then this one is just a slightly anomalous tooth that just needs an extraction. Um, <coughs> this would be a bad day, and <laughs> this was a bad day. I think this is staff pet because they always are. Um, and yeah, just unpleasant. So this is a good example. I've included this all together because it's 
easy to see on the mandible. You can say, okay, fine. When you compare this lovely periodontal ligament around there, and then come around and start to lose it, compared to these guys, um, there's just nothing, nothing to go get, but in a way that makes you quite uncomfortable. So here, for example, you've got a pulp system coming all the way down there, um, which in theory means we should take the whole, uh, whole tooth out, but the, um, you've got the lesion affecting the crown, so it does need some treatment. And basically, you'd, um, I would, or I did try and take this out, as, as much of this out as you could, but it's not going to, um, it's not gonna be fun, and it's not gonna be pretty, and you're just doing your best. But ultimately, the conclusion is it's going to be a crown amp. It just depends on where you draw that line. But basically do a big flap, open it up, and um, just take away a fair bit of bone, and then take out what could, and then what gets left behind. This whole dog needs um, x-ray monitoring, so not um, lose too much sleep over the fact that I'm gonna have to kind of crown amp slash leave some of these bits in behind. Um, more frustratingly is the maxilla, where because of the superimposition of the maxilla, it's often much harder to detect your periodontal ligament. Um, so on these ones, yeah, they're, if I had only seen these, I'd be saying maybe it's superimposition, I don't know. Um, but in the context of seeing the rest of this dog, I'm saying yes, I'm pretty sure this is um, tooth resorption as well. Uh, but I would be checking for uh, lesions in the mouth, and then if there were, then um, similar kind of approach is basically a deep crown amp where I can. But just frustrating case. Uh, back to a cat. We've got um, mesial root of your um, fourth premolar here is completely resorbed along with half the crown. Brilliant. And uh, so this would be a type three, and then your distal root extract it. Um, this would be your holy grail, brilliant. It's already almost gone. You basically just burr off the crown and stitch over the top, and it's already gone. <coughs> uh, these striations are worth noting in that these are often a, this is often a pattern of tooth resorption that you see, um, and so that's a pretty typical type two, so I would be crown amping about here and leaving the rest behind. And keeping an eye on this third premolar here, maybe early tooth resorption going on there, but not enough to, um, to go on for him right now, I think. Uh, earlier I mentioned inflammatory resorption where it's more lucent. So this is a good case where, so this one, it was filled with pus. Um, which will be part of the clue, but um, just be aware that um, you can't just cut it off there. You need to, even though it's got um, a lot of type two tooth resorption, you need to get rid of as much of that root material as you can. And again, don't if you can't get it all out, then fair enough. Um, but you should be trying to um, curette out any of that nasty material um, and get out as much of that tooth as you reasonably can. So basically do a big flap. Um, here we've got striation, so uh, type 2 tooth resorption, loss of periodontal ligament. Pulp comes down to about here, so I'd probably be using that as my marker to uh, a moderate crown amp down there. And otherwise, this one, I, I think this is this it doesn't look like a furcation to me. This looks like a um, uh, resorption in the furcation. Um, I think it's, it's too wide, it's wider than it should be, I think is why I'm saying that. So it's got tooth resorption, so definitely needs to come out. And then I would say you haven't got enough root there to take it out, so I'd uh, be crown amping him together with the canine. Uh, any questions about tooth resorption before we move on? Everyone could, yes. Radiographically monitor um, is certainly very reasonable. I guess it, 
I, I would be probably monitoring it. Um, it depends whether there's anything else going on and how motivated your carer is. If, like, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to take that out, but yes, you are justified in leaving it, put it that way. Over, and it looks fabulous, and you're like, oh, brilliant, okay, you sorted yourself out. Yeah. But it's very hard in that sense to justify to an owner <laughs> see evidence of resorption that's healed, and then you show them a tooth that's got a resorptive lesion on it, and you're like, oh, we know it's really painful, we've got to take it out. And it's like, well, I've got to come in two months later, maybe that tooth would have already. Yeah. So, so I think I can't back this up with a paper, but my. Gut is it, it tends to be this one, um, your third premolar. So these are the most commonly affected by tooth resorption, and um, they are, we call them sentinel teeth, where basically if they're affected by tooth resorption, often you'll have more subtle tooth resorption affecting other teeth. So that's what I would kind of focus on, is often these are the ones that will ghost themselves completely and just, um, just disappear, but the other teeth won't. Um, so with the exception of... This one, I think, is a fourth premolar. Um, it's pretty, so it's pretty rare for it to um, affect this tooth this badly, and there's been probably quite a lot of cat suffering for it to get to that point, and particularly for it to happen to the first molar behind this. Um, then that does take quite a long time. So whether or not anyone spotted it, like ultimately, we have to assume that that's painful. We know that tooth resorption is painful for cats, and it's fair enough the cats is the other teeth, even though, yeah, it's basically like, there's a high likelihood that the other teeth may be affected, given that this has happened to this one tooth. Um, so it's worth yeah. doing dental x-rays. And if you find nothing brilliant, that's yeah. like 20 minutes, wake them up. Because they'll always come in with a, oh, is it fine? You know, yeah. There's no quitting, there's no signs of all the pain. It's a challenge. Yeah, it is a challenge. And, um, that's the joy of working in referral nowadays is we've already got, you guys are filtering out the, the people that don't want to do it and we get willing people and that's really fun now. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that. <laughs> um, but yeah, ultimately all we can do is, um, is advocate for the animals and say, listen, we've got enough evidence that whenever you're probing these um, tooth resorption probes, un even under anaesthetic, the cat's jaw is, sh is chattering. We know that these are painful. Um, and often where people, you treat tooth resorption and when we've got those anecdotes where people come back and say actually they're much brighter. Um, like, but we can't drag them there, They've, people have to take responsibility as well. Conversely, when you've got, say you're doing an extra uh, dental on a cat again uh, that has had a number of mid-team cats, a couple of dentals in the line, you find what could be a retained route and it's sort of very vague you think it's been long enough there, I shouldn't yep. see anything at all if it was truly resorbing, could have had a crown amputation justified previously. There's nothing in the gum line, no redness. Are those painful? Are they not? So, again, that is quite controversial. There's, I've definitely seen very different opinions about that. Um, I think I would argue... If you don't have a draining, draining sinus <coughs> and they're radiographically quiet, then let sleeping dogs lie is reasonable. Um, you do have to look very carefully um, with your probe and make sure you don't have any draining sinus, make sure you've got good quality x-rays of it and radiographically keep an eye on it. But if it's fairly, if it's got, um, if it's well beneath the gum line and it's got um, like quiet bone over the top of it, then um, I'd say you're reasonable to, um, to leave that. But I can definitely quote you a few vet dentists who would argue that it might cause a problem and you should take it out. But I know that's not particularly helpful to give you a, a we don't know, but I'd say you're justified in leaving it. Um, so moving on to a few root abnormalities. So um, this doesn't need... Um, any treatment, it's just an incidental, or two incidental findings. But um, this, if this tooth needs extracting, then you really want to know about it by taking a dental x-ray. So dilacerated roots. <coughs> um, 
I think I come under fuse roots in a sec. So again, these um, fuse roots, you, when you're looking for them, you encounter them. Well, so when you're not looking for them, you encounter them quite commonly. Um, and again, this is the kind of thing that if you try to split this crown and then um, wiggle these two apart, and this tooth will shatter and leave a root, um, root down there that's going to be really unpleasant. And um, just think of all the times I didn't do dental x-rays on dogs, and then, ah, oh, I don't know why this, um, this tooth fragmented. It's probably something like that. Um, supernumerary roots. So there's a study in cats that said um, about 10% of cats will have a, their maxillary third premolar will have supernumerary roots. This isn't a cat, this is a dog, but just uh, an, an example that looks like this. Um, I'd say arguably less in my anecdotal uh, opinion than the study, but it's definitely worth doing the x-rays and just being aware that maxillary uh, third premolars in cats can have a third root, as can uh, any tooth, any multi-rooted tooth, as far as I know. Um, and yeah, it'd be typical you could... Uh, section this tooth and then leave a root behind that you didn't know existed. Uh, fused roots or anomalous single roots. So again, this one, um, some fused roots there, or this one here. So this would fill me with dread if I'd been trying to extract that. You'd expect this um, second molar tooth to have two roots. And again, right at the back of the mouth, hard to get to place. If you tried to section this tooth, split it and break a root here, then um, that's going to be a real challenge to go get. Uh, other congenital malformations that show up. Uh, I think this dog had some um, crown abnormalities, so um, some enamel hypoplasia. But the reason why dogs with enamel hypoplasia um, you want to do full mouth x-rays is that uh, you know that during develop during tooth development there was something abnormal going on, uh, and that can affect the roots as well. <clears throat> uh, similarly, congenital abnormalities, I think, oh, here you can see the um, enamel hyperplasia, which I won't go into too much detail on, but basically had abnormalities within the mouth, but um, similarly abnormal roots. And I think this dog also had, I think, suspected pulp stones, which, uh, again, not the most important to get onto, but it'll come up in a minute. And we've spoken about tooth resorption. Um... Pulp abnormalities. So earlier we spoke about um, over time the odontoblasts lay down dentine, so you can tell which teeth are non-vital or dead by their relative width to either adjacent teeth or uh, contralateral teeth. So who can tell me which of these teeth are dead? This one? This one? Yeah. yeah. So these two um, here wide pulp relative to their neighbours, so these two are non-vital. And you can see this one, maybe, maybe we're over-interpreting, but periapical lucency might be starting to form. But. Um, pulp abnormality, so irregular pulp, so this one, two scenarios, you've either got dental dysplasia, so you've got abnormal deposition of dentine, or you've got internal tooth resorption going on, but either way, if you've got um, really abnormal um, pop wits, then just basically note it and um, speak to a specialist because it, it kind of depends. There's quite a lot of variation in that on the rare occasions you'll see that as to how we might treat these. Uh, and then pulp stones, just as a side note, you'll occasionally see um, a lucent structure within the pulp that um, is just an anatomical variation that, um, unless you're going to do a root canal, is irrelevant from your purposes. Uh, getting to the end, other surgical considerations. So um, <coughs> this one, yeah, you've uh, got severe periodontal disease with marked bone loss, and you've already got a pathological fracture here. So refer it, make it our problem. Um, this one you don't need to refer, but consider how both the dilacerated root here, but also the relationship of this tooth with the mandibular canal means, yeah, you're going to have to be quite careful with where this tooth sits in relation to the mandibular canal and how much bone you can take off. So, Simon, coming to your point, um, this is a nice example of 
relationship of um, how the tooth can sit. So um, there are stats on it, but I haven't memorized them. And I'll get back to you with the, uh, with the paper you can, uh, you can have as your bedtime reading. Um, but basically, they can sit either side, and you don't know which unless you um, basically do a CT. Um, and this one, um, oh, mandibular canal. So um, I don't know if anyone's experienced this complication is um, decompartmentalizing a tooth through into the mandibular canal um, during an extraction. So fairly stressful. And um, these cases probably, um, so it depends if you're good at dentistry, you might be able to salvage this during um, if you're particularly confident and um, potentially open it up more and uh, and get it out. Don't be afraid to close it up and call a vet dentist and basically you can um, decide whether or not um, it's more invasive to to go get that out or um, or to leave it but basically make that a uh, specialist problem and that's fine as well. What, what can you have a Outcome by leaving a so, so you can basically. Um, there's, I guess it comes down to can the animals express pain meaningfully, um, and so some of them will express actual discomfort and be pouring at the face and things. Others um, won't show any sign that we know about, and so um, my supervisor would argue that actually the risk of going getting them. Um, outweighs the risk of leaving them if they're not showing clinical signs. I presume you would put that case on antibiotics if you have just stuffed a root fragment into the mandibular canal and you're leaving it. Um, I don't think necessarily. I guess in theory, you're, it shouldn't be the most contaminated. You've got like a good blood supply there. Um, I don't know. I don't think it would have crossed my mind. To resorption of the fragment? Um, pass. No one has, I had, I'm confident that no one has studied that. Doing yes. what yeah. Time frame? <clears throat> oh, um, so I wouldn't expect, I basically, actually, no, N equals two of Simone's cases. I think one did start to resorb um, from what I remember, and the other one didn't. Um, but I would re radiograph in six months. This is a case report I've just published, and um, this is a one-year, six-month-old dog who um, presented because of periodontal disease around just the left maxillary canine tooth. When the dog was six-month-old, it happened to have a deciduous tooth extraction. Uh, who can tell me what happened? Yeah, the root stayed in. So the, um, there's a little root fracture here, and they've pushed the deciduous root into, um, um, into the pulp of the developing uh, canine tooth, which killed the pulp and stopped it developing. So the other teeth have carried on developing, uh, and then it became a chronic inflammation. So that's in so, it rather than superimposed. Hmm? That's in it. Um, I'll... Show you, I should have shown you. I should have shown you the post X-ray, which is even more like a root. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, that like I don't hold this against the um, referring vet who did the original surgery. Is they actually took an X-ray, looked at where the um, deciduous tooth had been. They hadn't done a pre-op X-ray actually, interestingly, um, and they only did a post after they'd had a root fragmentation. And the notes said. Um, took x-ray, no root present. Um, and looking at their x-rays, it's less clear than this. Um, and you can see it hiding here, but not where, uh, where it should be and where they were looking. And so it's just a, they, basically they were relatively tunnel vision, but they were also having to take off dew claws, do a spay on this dog. Uh, they'd already done two, um, two decid just deciduous teeth extraction for 30 quid or whatever. Uh, and um, it basically just, that's the pressures of general practice, but it's just a good reminder to um, take the time looking elsewhere on the dental x-ray. Mm -hmm.